and we are back welcome back to uh, out of office again um, i hope you had a great time already for all the nice speaker we had so far uh we're gonna go ahead and um go with the dino anderson talk uh, dino is an operational development consultant and is helping companies to build trust empathy and inclusiveness within their company um, mostly, as we know, in the era where employees come from all over the world, cultural differences can be a challenge. And when working remotely, the team members need to develop their emotional intelligence. So this is really where Dino will come and um, teach us and make, make us learn more about how, uh, what he does with people he works with. So I'm going to go ahead and bring Dino to the screen. Unmute you. <laughs> Here you are. All right. Welcome, Dino. Well, thank you very much, Daphne, and thank you, Anna, and the Out of Office um, conference that we're having here, and everyone for joining and participating in this. Definitely the two talks that we had before were wonderful, uh, gave us great tips on how we can do a lot of self-care and also the questions that we should be asking uh, when we're coming on board mm -hmm. to an organization. That's really, really wonderful. Uh, the thing that I'm going to dive into, as Daphne said, is to speak about the values of a humane work culture and really think about building our emotional intelligence when we're doing the work, when we're getting ready to go on to a team, when we're ready mm -hmm. to take on a project. And in particular, uh, for us who are remotees, right, that often feel sometimes a bit left out or uh, hear about things after the fact they get done perhaps at an office or that we need greater ways of collaborating with one another mm -hmm. and actually bring the work uh, to completion in a good mm -hmm. and uh, humane way. Before you way. start, you know, I just want to, um, sorry, I just want to make sure that people uh, see your screen and uh, see your um, screen everything. And also to remind people that if they have any questions again, to ask them in the, the Q&A section, and then after the end, we will answer the questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and hide myself so I can give you the whole uh, spotlight on you, and I'll see you in 30 minutes for the Q&A. Have a good day. Excellent, one. all right, thank you, Daphne. And also here, uh, if I am speaking too fast, I would love people to uh, say so and Daphne to uh, pipe in and tell me to slow down if they need that. I wanna be as inclusive as possible for people from different cultures, time zones, uh, where English is not your first language. Um, and for people to understand certain phrases that I might use that may not be translatable into different cultures also for me to slow down because I've had a lot of coffee. So, okay. So these are values of uh, humane work culture. And I'm gonna be talking about inclusiveness quite a bit, trust and empathy. Um, and there's three different propositions I wanna begin with before we start diving into the skills that I wanna share with you uh, for building a humane work culture. And these three propositions, really these premises that I'm beginning with, the first one is going to be that we are all remotees, right? And what I mean by that is that work has always been done at a distance, right? Whether we're in one building and someone's on the third floor, first floor, fifth floor, right? Or that we have a company that has now grown to two buildings or two offices. We've always done work at a distance. One that we're finding now in offices all the time, especially with something like Slack, on uh, some of you might experience this, is that the person behind me or next to me sometimes will communicate with me over Slack as opposed to just turning around and talking to me. So uh, we have to bear this in mind that we're all remotees. What has really expanded this remote, co remote work culture is technology. Right. Technology has enabled and created new platforms where we can do more of this work at a distance and that we can do it at a greater distance. So technology is, a, is an enabler of this uh, remote culture. Uh, one thing that's really important also to note with this expansion of the remote culture is that right, we all feel what it's like to do work at a distance. Um, we all feel what it's like, as I said at the beginning, to have an experience where, wait a minute, something just went on 
you know, somewhere else. And now I'm sort of left behind picking up the pieces or trying to figure out how to accomplish the work I need to do. But it seemed like something changed, right? Goals change. And we all experience that or don't get to experience what it's like to have the water, what we call the water cooler conversations, where uh, you get to be t next to physically next to other people in a space and work with them. So uh, I just love to begin from the premise that we are all remotists. When we began with that premise, when we began with that first fundamental principles, we start to look at and, and treat one another differently. Um, Going into this, another premise that I have here is that collaboration is not an option, right? It's a reality. It's the reality of work. Um, work gets done by human beings, not by a computer, not by a technology platform, not by a chair, not by right code or anything like that. It's actually done by us. It's done by people. And these are people with full lives, people with aspirations, people with fears, right? People with values. And so these things are important to note because we often behave as if we have to leave who we are at the door when we enter a workspace or a working relationship. And I think that's um, sometimes a little dangerous to, to entertain because it pretends that we have a work persona and a, another right social persona. Um, I think work gets accomplished really well when we can bring our full selves to that work, our full personality, our full aspirations, our full values, right? Our full fears also. There might be things that we need to speak up about that are not allowing us to get things done on a team because real life happens, right? So we need to find co-creative ways of bringing that into bear into our work lives uh, without being disruptive, of course. So these are things for us to think about. So collaboration uh, is not an option. It's a, it's a reality, and I feel it's a very, very strong reality. Third thing that I want to start off this with is sort of premise and uh, assumption is that resistance to collaboration, to working with one another, I think is usually because of fear. And I'll give an example of that. Um, I say fear because here is something that I noticed at a work event that uh, we had about three years ago when I was working for this organization, which I won't mention. Um, and we had a uh, teams from all across the world come together uh, and to get some work, you know, some work done and to rethink how we're going to attack our strategies for uh, the upcoming year. One thing that happened there, which was a situation that just blew my mind was uh, everyone was so excited, you know, coming to space, all working with one another, meeting each other for the very first time. And one person from Brazil, uh, Southern Brazil, which is very different from Northern Brazil, Southern Brazil was finally so excited to meet this other person that was working from uh, Ghana. And so they yelled out this person's name across the room and was like, oh, I'm so excited. The person from Ghana shut down because they felt so disrespected that someone would shout their name across the room, right, that way. And so the person from Brazil didn't understand why they were wrong when they were trying to do work while this person would not even look at them, would not even work with them uh, in, particular, in particular ways. What we find in collaboration and, as I said, fear going on there is these what we call the reactive tendencies that start to come up when people are getting agitated. And try to see which ones you, you fall into here and uh, I'll give an example. And please, by all means, like in the chat, share which ones you might be feeling. So there's usually three types that we find in the coaching work that I've done also is that people go into reactive tendencies. One of them is control, comply, and protect. The controlling person is the person like when there's, uh, you're trying to collaborate and get something done on the team and the team is adjusting all these other things that don't necessarily uh, go along with your way of that you think the work should be getting done. You go into a controlling uh, mannerism. I'm going to raise my hand and say, I'm a, I'm a controller. <laughs> I like to go in there and say, well, no, nah, none of it is going to work this way. This is the way that we have to do it. And it has to get done 
these particular steps like this. There's no if, ands, or buts about it, right? I used to be a lot that way, and I've gotten better over the years. Another thing is people don't like conflict, right? So they're the people that are called the comply people. Like, we just need to get it done. Um, please don't fight. Please don't disagree. Okay, whatever you say, that's the way, that's the way. What happens with that person that keeps complying is that they're never bringing up their own resistances to the work. And the last type of behavior that's called reactive tendencies is to protect, is you may be working on a project and be like, everyone's getting really uh, tense with everyone. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm just gonna ignore all of this and go and work on my piece and just let that fizzle out. And the reality is, is that all these things agitate people, right? But we all behave in a way as if it's not fair. And so really where I'm trying to go with this talk is how do we face those challenges? How do we face those fears? Because there's something interesting about fear that comes up when we're working in collaboration with other people. And that is that there's value in resistance and challenge. There's actually value in there, right? And facing these fears, we have to actually face them and see what's underneath them because those fears are actually indicative and they're pointing to other, right, human qualities, whether they be about values, like the example I gave of the uh, Brazilian person and the person from Ghana, right, there's values there. It's about respect. And if we can face those and talk to one another about what those are, we can actually make work much more easy as opposed to going into, I do my own part, yes, yes, that's right, or I'm gonna take over, right? The, uh, the control, protect, and comply. So uh, for what's gonna follow, I'm gonna talk about three particular uh, uh, values here, choosing equal creative values to face fear, that I think are really important and that I've seen work actually really well. I'll definitely want people to contribute other values that they see, uh, that they've worked uh, to make uh, collaborative teams really flourish and really get some work, not only get the work done, but also help the team you know, build a strong relationship with one another. So these three values that I wanna talk about uh, are building communities of inclusion, building a community of trust, and building a community of empathy. The first one, inclusion, and I'm sure many of you have probably started to hear this, or at least where I live in San Francisco, diversity and inclusion is the big sort of buzz, neat thing that's going on. And we're all trying to do this way of how do we work together, right? Including cross-cultural differences, but also, right, including how we work at remotely at a distance and how we work with those biases that we have. So I'm gonna spend more time on the inclusion part because what we'll find with trust and what we'll find with empathy, it's just that we're gonna be repeating the skills of inclusion in each of these, right? So first one, inclusion. There's a skill there that we practice in inclusion that's called three skills. Design Alliance, we'll get to them in a moment. And another one that's called Finding Right and another one that's called Acknowledgements. And I want you to think of these temporally. That is, Design Alliance works really great at the beginning of a project. Before you enter a team, before you enter working with one another, you need to have working agreements, right? That enable you to speak what you need to get the work done and for you to hear and listen to what do other people need to get the work done, right? And that example with the, uh, that I gave with the uh, Brazilian and the uh, Ghanese person, Imagine if they had spoke to one another and talked about, well, this is how we love to meet and greet one another. This is what I think respect looks like, how much that barrier to work would have been removed, right? Finding right, we'll get into that, and acknowledgements, right? Finding right is when the work gets tense and you're in it and you're doing it, and then some other thing is thrown into the project. Like you, instead of getting it done at the end of the quarter, all of a sudden you've learned that you have to get it done at the end of the week right? Uh, it creates a lot of tension and friction. And so people's resistance and fears come out a lot more. And then acknowledgement is what happens at the end of the project, always remembering all the small things and big things that people have done, which is really important. 
So this text heavy here, and it's just giving you some examples at the bottom. So the inclusive skill number one is what we call designed alliance, right? It's one that we've used very often in at least the workplaces where I've been is uh, these working agreements. And so be clear, it's most important, right? Before you enter into any kind of relation, you want to be very clear about what is needed. Any type of relationship, whether it be right, a romantic relationship or a work relationship or both, right? You want to be very clear about expectations and what makes you feel good. Here's some example questions to ask at the beginning of a designed alliance with the team. It says, what do each of us expect and want from this relationship? What are the conditions that need to be in place for us to work together effectively, right? Who will be responsible for what? Should be no surprises right, for people. Uh, what are the potential obstacles to success? This is one that I want to slow down on. Potential obstacles for success doesn't just have to be work related, right? Like I don't have this particular software to do this thing. It can be something as simple as, as a parent, I have to leave at a particular time to go and pick up my kids from daycare, right? As a person who has, and I'm very, very big on mental, uh, mental, uh, mental inclusion, mental illness inclusion in the workspace, you know, uh, we did this for one person, which was very, very wonderful, and I commend all the people who uh, practice this courageously, is that sometimes people need therapy, right? And they need to go for there be physical therapy or psychological therapy for them to always be successful. It's a place where they can ask and say, hey, uh, Thursdays at two o'clock from two o'clock to four o'clock, I need to have some space to do this kind of work. That's something that comes up in a designed alliance, right? That way that person doesn't feel shamed or that person doesn't feel like, I need to always make up a, an excuse for why I'm not around, right, to do this kind of work. I think for us who are remotees, like there are a lot of other realities that come into place. Um, when we're doing work, whether it be the children coming home or partners coming home or, you know, street noise increasing, whatever it may be, or you're at a coffee shop and right, things, you lose connectivity. So uh, it's a great thing to bring up those, those, those challenges. And then you can see the other ones on here. I love to do this thing like just a silent reading so people can see what's up there. And these slides will be available. So if you want them later on. And I want to jump to the last one on here. How will we celebrate success? We often overlook this in teamwork. Um, is how we are going to recognize one another for the good work that we've done and also how we as a team are going to celebrate, right, when something good happens. It's a very important, right, it's that emotional response that we get from working with one another that keeps us going, right? And that helped to build a uh, good, good cohesion with the team. So that's designed alliance, inclusive skill number one. Inclusive skill number two is what we call find right. And so this one's a little more tricky. And so there's an example in here. So and if you have questions after this, definitely uh, ask me. This one's a little more tricky because this skill often develop, uh, develops upon other skills, like being a very good listener, being authentic in your response. So find, right, realign, redirect. When we're in the midst of a project, and I said this earlier, when we're in the midst of a project and we said, okay, we have to get this done, right, by the end of uh, the quarter, but all of a sudden some reorg happens and now your team has to get it done, right, in two weeks as opposed to the six weeks that you have. I want you to think back on those three qualities that I gave um, the type of person that you might be when this kind of situation happens. Are you the person to control, go into your control stance? Are you the person to go into your comply, let's just get it done? Or are you the person to go into your protective stance and be like, ah, it's getting tense. Let me just focus on my thing and get it done, all right? I see this, you know, we, we all experience this. This happens on all teams. As a, uh, uh, as a manager on a team, I've seen this come up so many times where people just, they lose it, right? They wanna go faster or they are suggesting things and they're feeling over, oops, they're feeling um, overwhelmed. So I'm gonna use this example down here and just read this out to you all of a way that we find right, realign, redirect, right? Because we have to get work done. 
but we don't want people to um, feel like their ideas are not important. So a meeting participant says, there is no way we can accomplish that in the time frame you are asking us to do it in, right? We have too many things on our plate. Absolutely, absolutely. This is to find right response. And this is to see someone and say, you are so right, right? We do have a lot on our plates. And I'm also concerned about these things, just like they are, say like being with the person. The realign response to remind them that there's this goal there, it goes something like this. This project has become such a high priority that we need to focus on it. If we need to put something else on the back burner to do that, we will. So it's acknowledging to the person, I see what you're saying, and also acknowledging to them, and we have to get this other new thing done, right? So let's come up with a creative way or some way where we can look at what we're doing and refocus on there. So this is being with the person, right? And lastly, redirect, right? And this is probably good practice for managers and for other people too, right? Uh, in redirecting the response, you would say something like, well, you will look, at, will you look at make a request? Will you look at your workload? And let me know by the end of the day, how we can prioritize to make sure we can meet this deadline. Throughout this finding right, the opposite of that is finding someone wrong, right? So this is what you're not doing. You're not finding someone wrong to say what they're suggesting or the stress that they're coming you know, and, 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 and sharing with you. Don't belittle it, right? There's value in what they're saying. Find the value in that. And this isn't just to make someone feel good, but it's to have someone understand that you see what they're trying to contribute and you understand where they're coming from. There are a whole bunch of more examples like this. And I, like I said, this is the one that is the most tricky uh, because no one wants to be inauthentic in giving somebody uh, uh, and realigning them to the project on there. Well, no one wants to be inauthentic in what they say. So that's a fine right. We can talk about that some more uh, in the question period. The last skill that I want to share here with you is around acknowledgments. Right? And this is at the end of the project or at some phase of the project that gets uh, completed. Uh, always remember to have acknowledgments, big and small, not big or small, big and small. Right? One thing that we used to do at these meetups with uh, global meetups with everyone we would go to an event is we will acknowledge everyone from the, in HR from the payroll. Right? payroll, which you normally don't think about, like payroll, they just have to like, I don't know, put some things in, punch some keys, and voila, you get paid, and just uh, make sure that you get paid. That's actually a very important, right, uh, undertaking to have if you're in payroll, because you have to make sure that people, right, get paid in time, that they're incentivized in the right ways, that you don't create any roadblocks for them, because some people are depending on that money on a particular time to make sure that the lights stay on to make sure that their children get fed, to make sure that right, they can pay for whatever it may be. So that's a very important job right, to have there. So we acknowledge their, their, their contribution to making the entire organization run smoothly to those people that are at the CEO level or the executives right, for their thought leadership that had maybe been important during a very um, uh, uh, stressful project. So examples of this, and I just put these on there, you can read them, but right, they, they actually do come from uh, this uh, wonderful event. And that's, you know, acknowledge for uh, OO for creating an inclusive event, right, of diverse perspectives. I really do like that listening this morning to both speaker was, both speakers was really great. Um, and I love the opportunity also that they created uh, and their commitment really demonstrates their commitment to improving remote work culture. Right. That's not inauthentic. We see them actually doing something, right, to improve this. So in the acknowledgement, you're finding that value that they're bringing to a project. And also to Daphne and Anna for being excellent, excellent people um, and, doing, and doing this. And more importantly, that, you know, I, I think their commitment um, to helping each individual speakers, and particularly may I ask for extra time to go through my, my talk with them because I uh, as much as I love speaking to big 
groups, it always scares me to speak to a big group that I can't see. <laughs> so I really want to thank them for uh, holding me through that process, which is really important. Um, I'll add some other acknowledgements in here too. Uh, a lot of the work that where this comes from is uh, people like World Blue organization, uh, Barrett Values, uh, who looks at how you can really achieve aspirational values in your organization without overlooking other ones. The Clayman Institute of Gender Research and Study for really, I think, helping cultivate in me a way how you remove bias um, from a lot of processes, especially when we're looking at women, uh, enabling women leadership uh, to come forward in organizations. Um, it's made me a better person. And so, and I'm glad that I have that opportunity now to share that with other people. So those are kind of acknowledgements. They're authentic and they're real. Uh, the second thing that I want to talk about here, the second value is about building trust. And the most important thing, just like respect, just like in that example of the um, Brazilian and the person from, uh, you know, uh, respect isn't something automatic, right? Trust isn't something automatic, right? It's something that is earned and something that is cultivated. I learned this from doing work in a global organization where, let me an example, in the US, often how business gets done is you first cultivate a relationship with one another. And then that's kind of all the trust comes there and then you just sort of, well, I trust that the person will do the right work and do the right thing. When I was working in German culture, I thought, oh my gosh, these people are so rude. Like, why do they not want to do the wonderful thing of going out for a beer and like hanging out and that kind of stuff? And what I learned there and their value is actually demonstrate that you can do the work first and then we build the relationship. Same thing goes for uh, organizations and people I work with in China. Same thing. I don't give you that trust just automatically, right? So, this is an important value to, uh, to, to, to really think about how you cultivate. When looking back on those skills that I just gave on inclusion, is when you're building trust in the community, the ways of acknowledging people, the ways of finding right, re realigning and redirecting, and the ways of including them, right, and having working agreements, if you do that successfully, we know that that is going to right, be a way of cultivating, I trust you. Why? Because you see me. Why? Because you heard me. Why? Because you allowed me to actually bring more of myself to the work process. So trust is a way that, it, trust is a value that one can use um, in the manner of cultivating what just happened before. And the value three, uh, building a community of empathy. And this wasn't in there before, but I needed to add in to having a wonderful conversation with uh, one of my uh, former colleagues in the PhD program. Uh, I used to be a philosophy professor. I'll talk about that later. Uh, <laughs> uh, and as I was talking about empathy, she had this moment with me. She's like, why is everyone talking about empathy? No one, no one remembers sympathy, right? Because simpatico at the very root is about being with someone, right? being with someone, not just uh, pretending that you have the same sort of experience that that person had, but you're going to be with them and stay by their side. So I wanted to be inclusive and include both here, empathy and sympathy. And this is about the relationship in general. You want to be in relationship with people. You want to right, have the relationship with the person and you want to be for the relation. Right? And what that means in being in with someone in the relationship is that you're there. Right? You're going to stand there and, and, and uh, be an advocate for them. You're going to understand when they say something. You're not going to judge them. Right? With the relationship, right, is that someone knows that they can always count on you when they need to voice a concern. Right? And being for the relation is that you become an advocate all the time. This is the way that we need to work and be with one another. Right? We need to have this kind of relationship with one another. Just imagine if you took on that perspective all the time, how much more, pe how much more people will feel comfortable with that. So and these are sort of parting words, words here, sort of creating an environment where we need to listen to one another, right? Listen to one another's needs. That's in the uh, designing the alliance. 
encourage each other's contributions, right, big or small, and acknowledge each other's accomplishments. Right? We often, often, so many times, we often overstep these uh, in the work culture, right? And it stems from, well, I don't need to have these particular values, or I don't need to have these like pat on the back for doing a good job because work is work. Work isn't work, work is an extension of who we are as human beings. So I'm gonna encourage everyone, I'm gonna give an action item here, and I'd love to hear what everyone experiences with this. And the action item is to face the fear with courage. Right? Co-create a collaborative environment. Here's your action item. And especially for remotees, because it's a little easy to do at the water cooler where people are having like a little conversation, but with remotees, next time that you go into a meeting, right, use one of these values, whichever one you feel most comfortable with. Right? Use one of them, if you're like, hey, I want to pause right now in the team and acknowledge, you know, Daphne for doing such an awesome job at ushering everyone and doing the transitions here between the different talks and seeing the thread that's being pulled through. I think that's a valuable perspective, invaluable perspective that we need to have, right? Do those things and then share results. You can share the results with one another. You can share the results with me because I'm in a constant learning process uh, in this uh, endeavor. And you can share those things out uh, at my email, Dino at Bofan Works. You can tweet it out at Maz Dino. And this last one here, I think I'm the only Rodino Anderson in the world. <laughs> so on LinkedIn, I think it'll be pretty easy to find me. Um, if you do find another Rodino Anderson, definitely share that back with me. So looking forward to your questions and looking forward to actually what you go out there and learn by trying to be human and humane thank you so much us. thank you so thank much you. to know it was an amazing very impactful talk many people are are writing in the chat right now if you want to see people how people are reacting so now it's nice to have some feedback from people so uh yeah really inspiring uh, really inspiring thank you, thank you. Uh, so we'll have time, we'll, we're a little bit over time now, but uh, we'll have a little time for some questions. So I'd like to go ahead right away and ask the first question to you from Sorab again, who's asking a question about how useful is sharing revenue information with the, within a remote team? Um, how useful it is to um, share the revenues, build trust within, within a remote team? We know that many companies are doing this. Sharing, sharing the revenue information of all transparent yeah. with that no absolutely i think as long right we always share things uh here's my fundamental way of in anything that we share is never to shame other people but it's actually to uplift them so i think whenever you share something do you have that intention in mind of how we okay this thing that i'm going to show you all is going to give you information on the aspirations that we're trying to get to and so where we can change our behaviors to work with each other in different ways. And what we're looking for ultimately are creative solutions on how we can get to right good budget expenditures, creative solutions on how we cut out this particular cost. So no one feels shame, right? They're like, oh my gosh, we're that team that spent too much money in traveling. Like, because that's working in HR, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> we often sell those things. So. Yeah. Good, thank you. And let's go ahead and ask another one um, from Siobhan. How do you cultivate empathy when most of your communication is text-based and lacking in visual cues? You're not having feedback from people. So, so good, so good. Uh, that, is, that is the, I think, one of the most difficult things. And I thank you so much for asking, asking that one. For me and my journey in doing that is I uh, became an executive coach. And one of the things that we learned in executive coaching was in that being present with people requires a certain kind of listening, right? Um, and a listening, and it doesn't have to be a visual cue. It could be something on the phone. It could be also something that people type. And this listening is right, that they call three levels of listening and it's a whole other skill to cultivate. And the first level of listening is that when you're hearing things, you're automatically replaying it in your head so you're only having a conversation with yourself. The second kind of listening, level two, is I'm listening to what you're saying, 
but I'm not really thinking anything that's going on here. And level three is what we call an, a sort of oral kind of listening. A listening that's listening to what you're saying. I'm attending to what's going on in here. And I'm also in, in, you know, in tune with the environment, which comes out so clearly in how people write, comes out so clearly in how people communicate, right? If someone's using all caps in an email, you already know like something's going on there, right? If someone keeps emphasizing a word, right? It's always there. But I think the skill to always, here's the courage to practice. If you ever get confused by what the intention of someone's meaning was, ask them, yeah. ask them. Don't be afraid to say, for clarity, what did you mean by this? For clarity, what are your intentions mm -hmm. by that question? That's something, again, we don't do in work culture. So be courageous and ask those questions because you want to you want to thrive just as much as Yeah, there's do. also a language barrier sometimes also the way some people are like me yeah. that are like English is my second language and I'm French speaking first, where I will speak and I mean, when I, will, I will write on Slack, for example, it might not be as well, um, you know, yes. not bringing all the subtleties that native English speakers will bring in when they have to talk about like difficult topics and things like that. Interesting. Absolutely. Good. We have time for another one. Um, so do you have any tips? This is Mark asking, do you have any tips for reinforcing expectations on communication and process to build trust and synergy on a team? So, Thank you, Mark. Tips for reinforcing expectations on communication process. So Mark, one thing that I didn't mention at the very beginning, right, in this thing about the um, building the alliance, Right, that's the time, right, expectations that you have on the team. One thing that happens is, right, that alliance gets broken for some reason, something happens, we're like, wait a minute, I thought we all agreed to this, but this person keeps doing something opposite. There's a thing called revisiting your designed alliance, right? And again, courage to say, hey, you all, when this isn't going right, we said that we will address it this way. Let's have that conversation with one another about we don't feel right, these things are going on. So um, ask very clearly, all right? Hey, the process that we put in place doesn't seem to be working. Is there something that we need to know um, where we can get back to that process? Maybe the process isn't, doesn't, doesn't serve us anymore, right? If that's the issue, then let's talk about that. But if it's more about a human issue, right, with that one individual because something's going on, you've also given them space to say, hey, actually, you know, I'm in the midst of, because this happens, I'm going in, I'm in the midst of a messy divorce, right? And you're like, oh, okay, mm -hmm. right? Again, we're humans. Things are going on in our life world. So create a space where people can share without feeling like they're about to be shamed or condemned for doing that. Awesome. Thank you so much for all your answers. And I think maybe a last one, but at the same time. One, one. All right. No, we should just answer <laughs> quickly is how crucial is face to face time via video for building trust and empathy on remote teams? So as opposed to generally avoiding yeah. video in favor to text audio only communication. So many people with something are shy to the camera yeah. and they just want to like to stay on Slack and, uh, and chat there. What would you say Absolutely. about that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think exactly. I love that point, Daphne. Like people are shy. Like I worked in an organization where um, privacy and security, two organizations, privacy and security was of utmost concern to people. And so they would not communicate in any other channel except like ones that are verified and sanctified and they won't want any of that other stuff. So building trust and empathy. Use what's available to you. I think most important in any kind of medium is asking the right questions, asking the human questions, right? Asking what their expectations are, what they would like. If they actually heard you not say, jump into a video because that's how I work best. And you actually say, actually, you work best by not showing your privacy. Okay, let's share that with mm -hmm. one another, right? And how can we cultivate this good relationship with one another? And you'll be amazed what opens up from there. So. Always treat the other person on the other end like a human being. Awesome. That's ultimately a perfect way to finish this talk. It was an amazing session. So thank you so much, Dino, for joining us today. Thank you.
All right. Thank you all so much. Cool. Thank you so much. We're going to join you guys uh, after uh, for the session with Jason Fried. Thank you so much, Dino. Bye.